Hey, what's going on? It's the King Kevin Show. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all your support and love. We are on and popping. By the grace of God, I am here today, uh, April 16, 2014. I am, of course, your host, Mr. King Kevin Dorval. And tonight's show is about black spinning power and our spinning habits. You know, and uh, I want to make sure I let everybody know you hear the theme song playing in the background. Of course, that's the King Kevin Show. Thanks to my boy, Zotary Tino. Um, if you like the theme song, you need a beat, go ahead and contact me. And I will make sure I, I send you his information so that he can create song music for you. And he does videos as well. And also, shout out to Ephraim. Um, we had a marvelous time today shooting the Courage to Believe documentary. And um, we got one more, uh, we have about two, three more interviews to do, and that's going to be it. Everything else is just straight going to be uh, post uh, production and, and, and get, go ahead and get started with the marketing. Actually, we've been marketing this since last year, as you already know. Kevin don't play when it comes to his dreams, you know, because that's power. When you have a concept in your mind and you're able to bring it to reality, then, you know, you definitely got to give praises to God for that. Um, let me say a quick prayer before I continue with the show, as you already know what I do. Um, God is great, God is good, thank you for everything and all things, and I pray to have an awesome show tonight, oh Father God. May there be wisdom, knowledge, and understanding um, in dealing with economics, and I pray, Father God, that uh, people are empowered and blessed by those who hear this live and also those who hear the recording. May the blessings of the Lord make us rich and add no sorrow. Amen. All right, straight up. Now, we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty here. Um, who, did I forget to mention anybody? Anybody who's uh, supporting me and all that good stuff? Oh, yeah. Shout out to Mrs. Uh, Anderson. That's Dr. Carl Anderson's wife up there in D.C. We spent a, a, a considerable amount of time yesterday on the phone dealing with economics and the lack of power within the black community. Now, for those of you who don't know, black folks, we spend a whole lot of money every year. I mean, we straight go crazy. Like Dr. Borshing always says, we go crazy to go out and spend our money. And then, at the end of the day, we have nothing to show for it, but maybe some flashy and some nice hair extensions. But where's the power in that? You know, there is no power in that. And I, and I want to go ahead and give some real quotes in regards to the uh, topic of tonight's show um, as I mentioned is about uh, black spending habits and um, black buying power um, we definitely need to get um, on the ball when, when it comes to our finances because money is power you know that's just not a community say that's like the real thing and you look at a lot of black communities you see the lack of power but you are you see the power of destruction you see the power of you know what I mean disparity you know those things are power but that's not the power that we want that's not the type of power we want to claim you know what I mean so there's a process in order to get rid of that uh, mindset now come 2015 next year black folks are predicted to spend 1.1 trillion dollars Back in 2010, we were predicted, no, 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 we spent $913 billion, $913 billion, and then you go into 2013, we were projected to spend, which I um, hope to get the exact figures um, that we did spend, but we were projected to reach over a billion dollars, and we were very close to that in coming 2013. So, 2014, I guess this is going to keep on increasing and increasing, but like the Huffington Post um, article that I read, who benefits from this? Who actually benefits from all this spending? Are we benefiting from it? Are we being able to control? Are we able to produce? Are we, um, do we have power? Do we have the means to build schools, build our own homes, create our own jobs? $1.1 trillion or even $900 billion? Yes. 
If black people was a nation, we would be, with that kind of capital, we would be the 16th largest nation in the world. And the fact that that isn't going on, and which is the purpose of the show tonight, we need to do something about it because it's also predicted um, by Dr. Anderson and by a couple others that in, in about 50 years or so, black people will become almost non-existent. You know what I'm saying? Like black communities. Because right now we have an influx of, of immigrants from other countries taking over jobs in our communities. I'm talking about Mexicans, Chinese, Koreans, Guatemalans, and I love everyone. The fact of the matter is, they're being allowed to come into the country when we already have over 35% as a black community, 35% unemployment rate, but they're being brought in to take over jobs that we controlled, we had. So why not, my question to the government and also to the public, why not hire all these young black men and women and old who are unemployed, who are getting welfare every month, not because they want to, but because they have to in order to have something to eat. Um, in order to, to, to keep their lights on or to keep their gas on so they can keep warm. You know, I'm in sunny South Florida, so it's always warm here for the most part other than the, the surprise rain. But back to the matter at hand, I mean, what is that really saying? What kind of respect do does the government have for the black community? And we even have a black president right now, um, President Barack Obama. And is he doing enough? You know, that... Is up for you guys to answer. Me personally, I don't think so. But I did like the fact that he did the speech on uh, my brother's keeper and getting more mentorship. But but guess what? All of these issues that he spoke about in that speech, if you didn't see, go ahead and YouTube. It's called My Brother's Keeper. All that information he gave regarding the um, black on black crime rate, the dropout rate. The early pregnancy rate all of that could be avoided it can be prevented and it's much cheaper to prevent actually a lot of these um, epidemics if there were more money circulating within ourselves for some reason we have the mindset and I don't know where this come from but well I do know where it comes from but I'm not really sure exactly how to stop it with all this money and capital we have we can do uh, significantly a whole lot more than we're doing right now we can stop all this why are we begging for jobs making all this noise about jobs and the lack of jobs but we're spending every dollar we got as soon as we get paid we, we run to these other stores that are not black owned by the way which I'm not saying not to support um, these other races because obviously we are. You know, I'm not. You know, I'm. I'm not. I'm far, far races. I just believe in support my people as well. Everyone else does. You know, but why are we begging for for all these jobs when nobody, not nobody, but for the most part, we aren't supporting ourselves. We have over nearly a trillion dollars worth of capital to spend. Why not start our own factories? Why not start our own, build our own schools so we can educate and employ our people? The answer is within us as a unit. Um, the Honorable Marcus Garvey was a perfect example of that when he created the Black Star Line in, in, the, in that newspaper that, uh, what is it called? The Negro, whatever. He had that and also the, the, the United Negro Association, I mean, which had, what, over a million people, and they all put their money together to purchase things, purchase businesses, uh, create banks, uh, create schools, create an infrastructure, create a support base so that our children won't be running amok in the streets. Children are not going to respect their parents if the parents cannot have an answer and that's and that's one thing that the devil 
likes and he loves. He loves for us not to have an answer. He loves for us not to be able to prevent tragedy. You know, so it is tragic when we can't afford to support our youth. It is tragic when we don't have recreation centers or entrepreneur programs or even history programs to teach our youth their own uh, history so they can build their own identity because we have a culture you know but there we are being brought into schools now everyone else being brought to schools taught European values European cultures but what about our own cultures and for years and decades you know we sit back for the most part oh it's just you just learn about Ponce de Leon and Christopher Columbus and that's like a thousand nicks going to our psyche. You know what I mean? You got a, a, a thousand nicks going, lashes going to our emotional state, um, to our mental state, our, our, our spirituality being attacked by all this Eurocentric information that is not benefiting any of us. You know what I mean? It's not helping at all. And I'm wearing this necklace. Um, for a particular reason, actually, I'm going to be wearing it every day. So I hope you guys like it. It's the onk. And I'm going to have a show about that or a video one of these days. But this is part of our culture. This is part of our history. You know what I mean? So, and it represents life, speaking life. So I want to speak life um, to everyone tuning in um, this evening or if you're watching a YouTube recording. Uh, if you guys can call in my number with your questions or comments at the 305. 659.16 that's 305 659.16 and I would love to hear more of what you guys are thinking is the reason for this particular tragedy that is going on we have the answer in our face but we're not doing nothing about it we're so concerned about everything that don't even advance us at all we love what doesn't advance us and hate what does, such as reading. Do you know how much power and knowledge is in reading? Why do you think our ancestors took the time to write the scrolls, you know, just for, for themselves? They wrote these books. They wrote these scrolls so they can pass it along to the next individual, to the next generation, you know, and so on and so forth. That's what it's about. And the reason why our youth are running amok and doing whatever and to whomever who is near them which is most likely another black individual the reason why they're assaulting and violating and disrespecting because they don't know who they are we control we have the control of that that's in our power to teach our youth to teach our community about economic power economic um, prosperity you know what I mean the blessings of the Lord shall make you rich and add no sorrow. That's in the Proverbs 10, um, 22, which is a very powerful scripture. And making you rich, but you're going to need some wisdom with that richness. You know, uh, people suffer for the lack of knowledge, for this lack of wisdom, which is also in the Bible. Now, I want to go over some numbers with you all, and I hope um, that uh, everyone takes this. Um, I, I can try to uh, make this palatable, but uh, we're going to um, have a pleasant evening. Now, in 2010, African Americans, like as, as I said earlier, for those who didn't, didn't hear, 2010, African Americans spent $913 billion, and it was said to, we, we were going to increase that to $1.2 billion as of this year. In 1860, we were quasi-free, you know, we were semi-free, or free, uh, so to speak. And we were at the bottom of the economic ladder. To this day, we are still at the bottom of the economic ladder because, yeah, we have a huge capital that we're spending, but we are not retaining. See, wealth, a, a wise individual um, by the name of, what's, what's the name? This is a book I'm, I'm taking a peek at by Tamara Mc, McAleese. I don't know who this lady is. I don't know if she's white, black, Hispanic, but a very good book. Um, get Rich Slow. And I wasn't even going to mention this book tonight, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about it anyway. I've read like the first couple of chapters. But she says in this book that um, wealth isn't the amount of money that you can spend. 
As a matter of fact, wealth isn't the amount of money that you have or you can uh, accumulate. Wealth is based on true wealth. It's the based on the amount of capital you can retain and save and spend at um, at discretion, you know, not just furiously for, for whatever reason. So this book has a lot of great wisdom in it. It was printed back in 2002. I'm not done with it, but I definitely let you guys know um, what it's about. It has tons of information on how to save tax benefits and, and, all, and all that good stuff, you know, and, and it wouldn't even be right if I don't mention um, Mr. Claude Anderson himself, uh, Black Labor and White Wealth, which is a very powerful, awesome book. I've read this book once already. Actually, I read it twice, to be honest. Let me not lie. But as I'm going to say this regarding the black population. And we seem to think that crime and punishment and finances, politics, all these things are mutually exclusive. At least we've been taught that way. Um, newsflash, ladies and gentlemen, my kings and queens. No, they're not mutually exclusive. They are very much correlated. And as a matter of fact, one impacts the other. Your economic situation dictates where you're going to live at. It dictates what kind of education you're going to have. It dictates how much you can support yourself and your family. You can't support your family. Your children are not going to listen to you. Because no matter how many good morals you give them, no matter how many scriptures you read over them, how much you pray over them, if you're dealing with a troubled child and every time they have a, a problem or a school field trip um, or need some clothes maybe, or something for the prom or whatever the case may be, they may just want to get, get something simple to eat down the street because you didn't cook today. But you're giving them all these morals and principles which are not rewarding them for their good behavior. You're not rewarding them for um, listening to you. Because you can't afford to reward them. Guess what's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen? They're going to go get that money on their own. They're going to go rob somebody. They're going to break in somebody's house. They're going to commit a home invasion. They're going to perhaps even rob a bank or a corner store. I've done one of those things before. As a matter of fact, I've done two of those things before, to be honest with you. Very long time ago. You don't have to worry about that these days. But um, thank God that um, I am... Uh, a reborn African. Um, I have my consciousness uh, on all ten toes at this very moment as we speak. And and the reason why I'm saying these things is because we need to understand that our money means a whole lot. Why do you think when you go to church, those of you who do go to church, why do you think the pastor um, has offering? Because it costs money to have a ministry. It costs money to have an answer when the church members have an issue. It costs money to pay the bills. We just can't go to a place like a church, an uh, assembly of the upright, and think we're just going to sit there and enjoy a good message and then go home. You have to want to give something anyway. It is a curse to be stingy. It is a, it's very much a curse and a very ugly trait not to want to share the wealth or the abundance that you have. To whom much is given, much is required. And we definitely need to take heed to that. We definitely need to um, not forget those who have been in our situation. You think our ancestors worked so hard all those years, those decades, hundreds of years, so that we can be struggling to this day? You know what I'm saying? We, I mean, if, if, if we can go ahead and buy a Benz or we can go ahead and, 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 and get our hair done at will anytime, any day, why not save some of that for a scholarship, you know, to, to fund someone's scholarship, to uh, find out the kids in your neighborhood that are going to college or that aspire to go to college, need some books perhaps, pay for some of their books instead of just spending that money on you and just having fun. Those, you know what I'm saying, the discretionary income. And there's other things we could be doing with it. Now, what needs to happen, we need to go ahead and set up a plan. We need to have some sort of, and I'm working on that, by the way, some sort of way to collectively put our money together. Someone we trust. Hey, y'all trust me. You can definitely trust me. But someone I might even um, vote for or whatever. And, and something like what Marcus Garvey did. Something like Gaddafi was doing. Put the money together, 
save it, allow it to gain interest. I'm gonna put it in a black bank. You know, I love black everything. I got a, a black shirt on. I got black shoes on right now. You see the black uh, a sign behind me, King Kevin Show. And uh, you know, I don't know why I mentioned that, but uh, but anyway, put that money aside somewhere for a particular reason, whether it's to build schools so we can educate our children and teach them what they need to be taught. Not about, you know what I'm saying, scumbag Christopher Columbus and all these uh, uh, slave-owning presidents, but more about the African leaders and the revolutionary thinkers and strategists who helped us get to where we are today and some of the great black inventors something that's gonna uh, give pride back to the community you this power in unity even the Bible say with two or three in agreement you know the, the Spirit of the Lord is in the midst and I pray tonight the Spirit of the Lord is with us right now as we doing this show and I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm doing this of course to share that knowledge share that wisdom why is it that whenever we get paid we quit to go spend that money somebody else, but when the Jewish community gets paid, that money bounces within the community eight to nine times. Can you believe that? In the in the Arab Arabic um, community amongst the Arabs, they their money bounced thirteen times before it goes out the community. That means everyone in the community is gonna eat. I know you have a service or product. I need it. I'm going to support your business because you give good quality. You're one of the black people who give good quality. So let me go ahead and support you, my sister. Let me support you, my brother, my queen, my king. And allow me to support what you have, somebody in your family, what they have. And, 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 and for some reason, black people good for this. We know somebody who started a business. We know somebody working on a particular project. We know somebody writing a book. Or doing a stage play. We know someone who just opened up a restaurant. Or who has a restaurant. Who has a clothing store. But no, we're not going to go to them. We're going to go far and above our, our way. To go support, you know, someone, you know, the other racist community. While ours suffer. While ours, ours struggle to survive. And these black businesses go out of business. And Mrs. Anderson said that to me yesterday, you know, and, and, and that's one of the biggest situations and the problems that we have. Hispanic community, their money bounced eight times. But us, we go run straight to somebody else's store. And we could be keeping that money amongst ourselves and doing something very powerful with it. So we need to practice something like um, Mr. Anderson called group economics. We need to learn that group politics. There's powers in numbers. Let's not focus solely on affirmative action. I'm sorry, affirmative action, uh, civil rights, and all these other abstract things because those things are power. Power is in production. We need our own factories. We need to be building our own uh, industries, districts. There's plenty of stores. And you go into many, any black communities. As a matter of fact, there's a company, an uh, organization called a Pew organization and they did a, a research a couple years ago I believe in 2011 if I'm not mistaken of the 10 worst cities in the United States of America and guess what ladies and gentlemen kings and queens we were the number one race we were the majority of those 10 cities and guess what those cities were completely horrific. You talking about Detroit, you talking about Philly, you talking about ATL, you talking about um, I believe it was Houston. Um, and, I mean, it's ten of them. Detroit was the worst one. You know, we all know Detroit going through a whole lot, and and the, the situation that happened with uh, the mayor Kilpatrick that didn't help at all. You know, with him going to prison for all those other crimes, God bless the brother. You know, I don't wish him any harm, but at a time when we, you know, the country going in recession, the city is definitely going bankrupt. As a matter of fact, they, they uh, claimed bankruptcy last year, uh, the last, the, uh, the fourth quarter of last year, 2013. But in the midst of that, going through all the, all the situations they're going through, this man went and took the money and God knows what with it. So, what are we going to do about it? 
everyone that's about unity except us we we are the ones who want to assimilate we want to integrate with everybody else everybody's culture we the first one hey i want to assimilate what you are i want to be part of your culture i want to support your culture and guess what all they doing the same thing for us this is the thing you need to ask are they doing the same thing for our community now now you guys, you never gonna catch me sitting here calling anybody cracker or anybody nigger or anybody, um, any other racist slurs. There's tons of them. Believe me, there's tons of them. I'm by far not a racist. I love everyone. I love life. I love nature. You know what I'm saying? But I love, I'm in love with my culture, my African people worldwide. And that's what needs to be going on. That, that consciousness needs to, be, needs to be awakened so that we can support each other. We can love each other instead of harming and, and, and cursing each other. You follow what I'm saying? Um, and also, how is it possible that we can live on 2%? How is that even... How? how? Tell me that. How can we live on 2% of our income? As soon as we get paid, we go on, Hey, we're going to go pay, pay the white man, the white woman. As soon as we get any kind of change in our pocket. How about saving that some of that money for yourself? How about saving some of that money? Maybe spend five, ten dollars at, at at the local store, the local black store. What is wrong with that? We have to ask ourselves, what is wrong with us? What 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 is it? Do I hate? Do we hate our identity? Do we hate who we are? We have a beautiful country. We have greatness within us. But we're not exercising it um, collectively. And that's where uh, we are defeated. In, in when you think about it like that, we are defeated when we don't support each other. Unity is power. Unity is the only thing that's going to save our young men, our kings, from being shipped in massive numbers to prison. That's what's going to save us. It's not going to be these reality, reality TV shows. I know people are so com so concerned about what is going on with reality shows. They got this thing on right now with this girl, this sex tape going on, and they're, you know, putting it on all social media sites right now. I've seen it like, I've seen the post on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. A friend of mine sent to me on, on Facebook. About you know she's the the girl uh loving hip hop Atlanta what's it her name Nene Kiki whatever it is the red pretty one who's with Steve but it, it's so much attention um, towards that but when somebody posts on on the internet about the new business or um, a raise they got uh, they might get a few likes or shares but it's nothing compared to the numbers or the word of mouth of what's going on with reality TV and things on TV you know I think we spend too much too much damn time as it is right now watching TV I tell you, you need to be more time in them books you need to be more time researching our future where we want to be and not where we are because that's going to be the only way we want to get out of that in 1860 I already mentioned you got 1860 we were the bottom of the economic ladder but we were also um, there was only 51% of us, you know what I'm saying, 51% of us was unemployed at that time. 140 years later, roughly, it's, it's definitely over 40%, 35, 40%. It's, you know what I'm saying? So we still have the number one growing um, unemployment um, rate amongst a culture, you know, of, of if you want to call it a culture. And if that doesn't happen, our youth, we only leave them with three options. We can only leave our community with three options. One, Start a bit. Uh, well, let, let me rephrase that. Unless we do something about it, because you already have um, the uh, Baltimore, Detroit, forty percent unemployment rate amongst Black people. Pittsburgh, forty nine percent. New York, fifty one percent. You know, fifty one percent. New York. That's the same thing in eighteen sixty. And in the Black community. It's, uh, it's estimated only 2-5% to 5 of us own our own businesses and are completely independent. Everything we eat, everything we spend is based off the money that we make um, for ourselves, 
for our community and for the benefit of our community. Only only two to five percent can say that. Back in 2010, it was two percent. I'm not sure what the numbers are right now. I'd love for someone to share that um, with me uh, again. But these are the options that we, we leave our community with. This, this is the option we leave our, our youth with. You think about it. Because the situation that's going on with our youth, that is not, <laughs> it's not their fault. It's our fault. We the ones who made it like that, to be honest with you. We've given them the options to run towards entertainment, um, rap, uh, television, reality shows, social media, to deal with their realities. We didn't build them um, community organizations uh, throughout the country. We didn't build um, like a black holocaust like we should have done for our ancestors who died. You know, to, to not just so we can remember so that but we don't forget. Because if we don't forget, we're just going to fall in line. This assembly line that is going from point A, school, to point B, prison. And for some of us, there is no option A of school. It's just straight prison. Now, here's the options. Worst and best case scenario. One, what we can do, we can start a business and create everything from the top. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we are the CEOs, the managers, and the workers. We can run the whole operation from the top. That's option one. Option two, we can go to welfare. Yeah, we can go to welfare. We can make our living off welfare. How does that sound? Or, we can go ahead and jump straight to number three. Go down and just commit robberies, commit, like I said, home invasions, credit card scams, um, rob Peter to pay Paul. We can do that every single day if we like. That's the, that's, those are the three options. Start a business. Get on welfare, or go and commit crimes and 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 live um, what they pay us in prison. What do they pay people in prison today? What a dollar, a dollar a day, or something like that. You know what I mean? Fifteen cents an hour. It is absolutely ridiculous what these men are getting paid and women getting paid in prison right now. So the the question is, what are we gonna do about it? What am I going to do about it? Now, I know in my heart that the whole economic um, situation, that isn't my grace. You know, I'm not the best person when it comes to um, budgeting and uh, investments and finances, but I'm studying it. This book proves that. You know what I mean? It, it actually does. This book proves that, that I'm interested in economics and the finances. Not just for me. Of course not. A, you know what a righteous man is or a righteous person is? A righteous person is someone who lives and leaves something as an inheritance for their children. And some people are in a situation where they can do it for their children's children. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be thinking about that. Because if you're not thinking about that every Christmas, every Easter, every New Year's, hey, let's go spend 90% of our money to look good. You know what I mean? Let's go spend our money and support everybody else's business, everybody else's community, while ours continue to deteriorate. Yeah. It's deteriorating right now, as we speak, right now. You don't even want to know and see what's going on in Chicago and Detroit, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very ugly situation, but we got the answer. We got the power. God did not give us the spirit of fear. No, the guy gave us the spirit and of power, of love, and a sound mind. Some scriptures say of wisdom, of discipline, and that's what it's going to take every day. So I want to make sure you guys go out and support somebody, especially if you know they're struggling. Support their business. They might just smile and say, hey, man, open the store. They don't want to beg for your business. They don't want to do that. Who wants to beg anybody for money? You know what I mean? I, I don't want to beg anybody for money. You know, I'm doing a documentary right now, The Courage to Believe. Am I begging anyone for their money? No. People know what I'm doing. They know what my heart has to save our youth from these from these prison walls and from poverty, living on the streets. People know what my heart is at. And you know what I'm doing. So if you want to donate, you're going to do that. 
and, it, and, and as, a, as a matter of fact, my website is thecouragetobelieve.com. Thecouragetobelieve.com. You can click on the sponsor page and, and drop a few dollars in there to support this documentary because you know what? It is needed. I don't have all the answers, but at least I am doing something. I'm not trying. I don't try anything. And I don't ever use the word. I can't say I don't ever use the word, but I fight myself. And others around me in my circle, the king's circle, not to say I'm trying or I'm going to try. Get that word from the cafe or the word can't. That word does not exist anymore, 2014 and going forward. Because we have to put in our minds that we can do anything we want to do. We can build anything we want to build. Do you know they still can't? Imitate the, the pyramids and figure out how they built the pyramids. I'll tell you one thing that was necessary for the pyramid, actually, two of them, and this is a known fact and it's proven scientifically. One, you need money. Let me wind that. There's three things you need money, there needs to be some sort of economic structure, um, infrastructure, in order to build something like that. That took power. Okay, number two, you need a community, a community of believers and people who, who seen the same thing, who can see the vision of these pharaohs, these um, these kings and queens, and not just the pyramids in Egypt. We're talking about Kush as well, and around the world, there were over a hundred pyramids built along the Mississippi River in the United States. Well, there's only a Mississippi River in the United States, if I'm not mistaken, but we were never taught nothing about that. Why is that? Because we lack the power to educate ourselves or even the drive to do it for the most part. The third thing you need, because I mentioned you need money, you need a community. You know, everyone in agreement. The fourth thing is that vision. Without the vision, ladies and gentlemen, people <laughs> perish for the lack of vision. And that is why it's predicted in 50 years. Unless black people would perish as a community in the United States. In Africa today, over 200, it, it said 287,000. I'm not sure has that number um, gone over 300,000. Well, let's just say 300,000. Every year, 300,000 people die in Africa because of the lack of water, the lack of medicine, and the lack of food. Nearly 300,000 people. And that's going on now if the unemployment rate continues to go the way it is. And marriages within the black community. Marriage just isn't some kind of physical and emotional um, unit. No, marriage is an economic unit. There is power when you are married. You know, you can do things together. You can buy property. You get better deals. You know, you get tax breaks. You know what I mean? You get more love in the home, especially if it's a righteous marriage. So we need, we need more ma better marriages. We need successful marriages that make a better community. Because without it, it's just going to be a bunch of people living in apartments, paying, and, and, and ask yourself, who's your landlord? My landlord is a Jewish lady. You know what I mean? So you got people who are As we speak, we're paying our rent money to, but we're not owning the property. So who is benefiting in that equation? Are we benefiting or is everyone else benefiting? We need to own our homes. We need to own the condos. We need to own corporate buildings. We need to start our own factories. We need to definitely our own schools, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, we need to create our own clothes, uh, build our own cars, our own banks, our own hospitals. Look at the group over there in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Black Wall Street. Look what they were able to do. We can definitely learn from them. You know what I'm saying? We can definitely learn from the greatness. That's a prime example of what we can do if we stick together. Now, they had no choice. And I believe that's why... Um, we are the way we are as far as supporting each other because we got so many options. We, we done assimilated, we done integrated, um, <laughs> and everything else. You know what I'm saying? So, 
we don't have we we don't have to support each other with them. They they that's all they had. They built their own schools. They built their own uh, drug stores. They built their own factories. They built their own airports. They built their own not airports, but their own airplanes because black people couldn't get on airplanes back then. So we had you know what I'm saying we had to do it ourselves. We had our own doctors, black doctors, black attorneys, black teachers, um, black. Uh, uh, I want to say judges. I'm not sure about that. I need to look into that. And the whole town was bombed, firebombed. You guys ever heard that song by um, the Gap Band? Which, uh, uh, what's his name? The, uh, the music artist, Charlie Wilson. He's part of that group, the Gap Band. The Gap Band stands for those three streets that was there um, at that, you know, the, the main streets of where this, this Black Wall Street was. You know, G-A-P. And that song, You Dropped the Bomb on Me, it came from that particular situation. And oh my God, you guys, I almost forgot. Speaking of the history, we need to talk about Mr. Tucson Love and Cheer. Now, Mr. Tucson, uh, this is a black history celebrity. I'm going to take a little pause right quick on the black power, black spending power right quick and talk about my man, my our ancestor, Mr. Tucson Love and Cheer. Mr. Tucson Love and Cheer, you guys definitely... Um, you can chime in whenever you're ready, if you're going to chime in, because, you know, King Kevin Show will keep going. This is a black history segment today, so we're going to take a little, um, um, you know, a little time traveling backwards right quick, you know what I mean? Because we got to, the history is very much present today, you know. We'll not be here today if it wasn't for what happened yesterday, you know what I mean? So that's why I do the black history celebrity um, segment on my show, because... <laughs> I don't want to uh, uh, celebrate Black History only on, on February. Man, you crazy? I'm celebrating. I'm celebrating Black History every day, every day I can. Our children has been, you know, in, inoculated with all kinds of different spirits and ideas, all kinds of foolishness, <coughs> and you know, all these different cultures. But I never learned about Tucson Love and Cheer when I was in high school. I said once, my junior year, there was one paragraph that was like, not even a paragraph, two, three sentences. Literally, I'm being generous when I say three sentences about the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution ended um, back in, the, well, we got independence in 1804, but the revolution actually ended in 17. Uh, 94. Now, this was a 10 year war against the France and, and how they were, I mean, sh straight up violating every code in the book regarding dealing with the Africans, the enslaved Africans. Now, Mr. Tucson, um, he comes from my hometown in Africa, our hometown in Africa, the homie. Um, which is on the west side of Africa, which is today's Benin. His great, not his great, but his grandfather was an actual king in Africa. You know, in that country, that warrior kingdom. He was a king there. And Toussaint knew that. You know, and it, it, that knowing that bit of history about himself and about his identity allowed him to have confidence. Now, he was in charge of the horses. Um, at the uh, the plantation he was at, which was called the, the Breeder Fran uh, uh, Plantation, and the the slave owner there, you know, the last name was Breeder, and you know he was pretty lenient. He let my brother go ahead. He let the ancestor go ahead and um, read books, travel with his son to France, and get educated. So at the same time, his son's getting educated. Two some people getting too. Yeah, I'm getting educated too. So he's he's learning about economics. He's learning about history. He's learning about the global trade. You know what I'm saying? So he's learning these things and he's saving this information um, until he becomes the leader of one of the greatest wars of all times. And guess what? We won. Napoleon Bonaparte, which was um, supposedly the greatest leader, uh, military leader of the world at that time. You're talking about the 19th century. And Actually, the late 18th century, early 19th century, but he was defeated 
He was defeated by Toussaint, Dessalines, um, Henry Christoph, and the rest of these generals in Haiti. And he couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? This man could not believe it. Can you imagine? You're supposed to be this, this, this white power, and you want to enslave these people in, um, in, in the island of Hispaniola, which is now today Haiti. But you get defeated by these Africans. When everybody's praising you for being the best. So if Tucson defeated the best, what does that make Tucson? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that make him the best of the all-time history? But they'll never tell you that in school. They, they're so busy telling you about um, the, the, these other uh, uh, military generals uh, of America, you know, these other presidents. Um, you know, Mr. Jackson, you know, Andrew Jackson. Um, you have a uh, cluster, the other Amer uh, American general. Presidents like Carter and Kennedy and Joe Washington. Joe Washington had so many damn slaves. Abraham Lincoln wasn't even going to free, you know, he wanted to keep us in slavery if it was going to keep the, the, the north, the northern um, colonies, you know, intact for the economy because the slavery in the south was um, destroying capitalism. You know what I'm saying? It was literally going to destroy capitalism if they didn't stop because there's so much being produced in the South that the North, with all the factories and the reconstruction area they were going through in the North, it was um, causing some sort of imbalance with the money. We have all this product, but we can't sell it because you're making too much, so we need to stop slavery. And the South was really going to war for that. You know what I mean? And, and as, as a matter of fact, there were some Haitian soldiers who came in to fight in the Civil War. But they don't tell you nothing about that, man. They know the fact that these Africans, these Haitians, they didn't even want Haitians in America at that time. And to this day, it's still the same because of what happened um, back in um, 1794. Now, the war lasted um, over 10 years. It, you know, even though it ended in 1791, um, it, it started um, 1790. If it started, if it ended 17, no, 1794, I'm tripping. So if it started in 1794, 10 years before that was 1884. And, but there were little uprisings going on at the time. You know, it didn't just, you know, start just like that. Matter of fact, I don't think Tucson even wanted to be in that war. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I don't think he wanted to, he didn't want to leave because he loved white people so much. But doing the fact that he was experienced and God blessed him with all these opportunities to learn about economics and trade and agriculture and horses and his people were going to die because he knew once this slave rebellion started, thanks to the training of a bookman, Duty Bookman, who was a, um, from the, the African that was um, brought um, into Jamaica, then exported to Haiti because of you know his 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 African roots and he was into uh, into voodoo very heavily, you know um, you know Haiti, uh, voodoo was very much practiced in the western every oh, literally every culture in the western part of Africa it was a daily thing um, when they teach us about voodoo they teach us about voodoo's you know putting curses on people and spells and this and that when voodoo actually is a religion just like Christianity is a religion. You know, it, it wasn't, it isn't about worshiping the devil. Now, there are people who do evil things. Because like people do evil things in Christianity, evil things in um, Catholics. You know what I mean? Evil things in nation, um, not nation, but the Muslim religion. So you're going to have some, uh, what you call, rogue individuals. Um, and, uh, no, but, but, they, but anyway, Mr. Tucson, I'm going to give the whole month of May dedicated solely to the Haitian Revolution and um, dealing with the present situation in Haiti and the future of Haiti, the great, the victorious future of Haiti. You know, we will come back. Everything comes in full circle. You know what I'm saying? We will be back. And if anybody know about African history, anybody know about black history or history period, you got to bow down to the Haitian Revolution point blank period because this was such a huge blow against slavery in America and around the world that all these slave owners knew that it was gonna it was gonna have to end because they understood that this news was gonna spread. 
Knowledge is power. Once we got a hold of that information, once the enslaved Africans in the American colonies got a hold that that they are great, and our history doesn't, you know, it didn't start. Well, let me not go into that right now. That we aren't born to be slaves, ladies and gentlemen. We are born. We are queens and kings, the originators of earth. You know, the African woman is the the mother goddess, the mother of the universe, the black woman. The black king is the is the king of the universe. You know what I mean? The father of the world. Us, but they kind of thinking that we are irrelevant, expendable. And that's not the case by far, but we don't get to that. Trust me, May, don't want this episode. Every King Kevin show of May will be solely dedicated to to Haiti, period. You know what I mean? And uh, those who don't know, I am Haitian, as you can tell. I'm very passionate about um, Tucson Literature and the Haitian Revolution and just, you know, the liberation in itself. So you know I got to come out with a book with it. But we're going to get into that. You know what I'm saying? So speak life like this Unc symbol says. You know. Maybe this thing point straight. Now I want to get back to the show. And, and talk about speaking more life over our economy and economics. One of these days I'm going to get me a big silver one like this. Speak life. Alright. Now enough of that. Now, there are some interesting things I found out regarding black people, and one of them was that blacks spend um, a lot more time on going on trips where places to shop, but we don't. We spend less money. We take the most trips to stores. Like we do a lot of pretty much window shopping. Um, uh, blacks are in a higher income bracket, you know, than than 20, 30 years ago, which which is very good. Uh, there are 23.9 million internet users that are black. That's a huge market. If we can come up with a way, black organizations, black marketing companies, and marketing firms have already tapped into this, but we can <coughs> make a large amount of money if we focus our attention and our marketing and our products solely to um, black consumers because we are consumers, but we need to be producers. Okay? And another very interesting thing, we have. There's 33.3 million uh, black folks around the world that have cell phones. That, that was pretty interesting. I, you know, I didn't know that was that many. So 33.3 million. And, 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 and it is said that the reason why black folks spend so much, that the, the companies like Coca-Cola, um, you know, uh, Mercedes and Cadillac, um, a lot of these department stores, the reason why and these corner stores, they set up shop in the black community because they know we are foolish when it comes to our money. We have no discretion. We're going to spin, 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 spin. We're going to make it rain every single dime until we go broke. You know that term, ball to you fall? Why is that so important? You know, Black people, we ball to we fall. Now we need a ball until we rise again. You feel what I'm saying? That's when we just go on. And um, ladies and gentlemen, to be honest with you, I, you know, I, I, we need to do something. You know, I'm pretty much done with what I wanted to say for the most part. You know, I'm not going to hear some different. I've been getting feedback on Twitter, by the way, my Twitter is at Curse to Bleed regarding the situation. But well, we, we, we definitely have power of the purse. You know, what I'm saying we definitely have the money. We have the stage, and we, if we could take advantage of that, if we decide in our own minds that we are going to. Do something great with our money. You know what I'm saying? From 2009, we were estimated to spend 500 billion. No, we spent 500 and uh, billion dollars, 507 billion dollars. That's a whole lot of money. 2008, um, increase of 16 percent. You know we, you know, and we spent, uh, you know, 435 um, billion dollars. So from 2009 to 2008. There was a, a, a $435 billion um, increase, 
you know, as far as percentage wise, 16% um, increase from uh, uh, five, uh, 435 to 507 in uh, 08 and 2009 estimated 836 billion, 2010 um, 913 billion, uh, 2013 1.1 trillion, 2015 estimated 1.3 trillion dollars, trillion with a T. I mean, come on, we gotta do something about this here, man. We gotta get that money circulating amongst our, you know, each other. And that's pretty much what I want to say tonight. Uh, God bless y'all. Power to the people. Power to my ancestors. Those um, who passed away. Everyone in my family. You know, one time for Nick, man. I love you, man. Rest in peace. Um, God bless y'all. Hope you had a great time. And um, we'll be here, uh, you know, this uh, same time, same place. 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, King Kevin Show. I love y'all. What well, I'm saying, I have more than love for you. God bless y'all, and may the blessing of the Lord make you rich, add no sorrow, and please pick up a book and be blessed. King Kevin Show is pretty much about to be over. God bless. My chick, yeah. Mm -hmm.